uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Professor Gonali Anake from Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians. Welcome all of you to this important CME sessions. I think it's definitely a, a timely topic as per the current circumstances in the country. Uh, and this is a collaborative effort of Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians, Sri Lanka Medical Association, and Allergy and Immunology Society of Sri Lanka. Um, most importantly, let me thank uh, first uh, Dr. Nadisha Badanasingha, Senior Lecturer at uh, University of Kalania, and Dr. Danushka Dasnayaka, Consultant Immunologist uh, at Medical Research Institute uh, for organizing this webinar series. This is the first of three back-to-back -back webinars on drug allergy uh, area, uh, I think, which has a lot of unmet needs. So let me introduce the speaker now. She, he is the, he is a Dr. Thiruma, he's Professor Thirumala Krishna. Uh, he is the chair of allergy, clinical immunology, and global health at the Institute of Immunology and Immunotherapy at University of Birmingham, which is a world allergy organization center of excellence. He has much experience, professional experience in this uh, area of expertise. Is honorary consultant allergist and immunologist at University of Hospital University Hospital Birmingham, uh, in the United Kingdom, and he's the head of postgraduate school of pathology in UK. Uh, he's uh, he's providing expertise related to allergy and immunology again, and he's also the adjunct professor of Department of Pulmonary Medicine, Christian Medical School, Vellore, in Tamil Nadu, India. And his research interests are related to allergies, particularly drug allergy and anaphylaxis. And he has contributed to literature immensely with more than, I think, uh, over, over 100 publications in journals and textbooks. And most importantly, I think he was a co-opted member of NICE Allergy Guide, Clinical Guideline uh, Development Group in 2013 and also lead author of British Society for Allergy and Clinical Immunology Guideline on venom allergy, which is quite relevant to us, and co-author of four other important guidelines. Uh, if I uh, list them, immunology for allergic rhinitis, penicillin allergy, penicillin allergy deep labeling by uh, non-specialist, and pollen foot syndrome. So he has a wealth of experience related to this field of allergy and immunology. So thank you, TK, for sharing the knowledge with us. Over to you now. Thank you very much, uh, Gowani, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to be here, uh, albeit uh, virtually. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Gowani and her colleagues uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity, uh, wonderful opportunity to, to be here with you today. And I would like to thank the Sri Lankan College of uh, Pediatrics, Allergy Immunology Society of Sri Lanka and Sri Lanka Medical Association for providing this platform. So uh, my uh, contact with drug allergy, I'll put it that way, goes back to in the uh, mid nineties when I was training in the University of Southampton. And uh, you know, I found drug allergy always a very daunting topic, but uh, it so happened that when I moved to Birmingham, uh, I was given the task of setting up the drug allergy service. And I think uh, I learned on the job and I think that's the truth, really. And as I saw patients, you know, I, it, it became very obvious to me that uh, drug allergy labels are a significant impediment, uh, if you like, uh, to, uh, to, to routine clinical care. And there is no real escape to, to, to drug allergy because uh, you're going to encounter patients with self-declared uh, drug allergy uh, wherever there are prescribers. Uh, so therefore, you know, I think it's really important that uh, we raise the awareness of drug allergy and we all have a basic level of competence uh, and skill to be able to confront drug allergy in, in, in routine clinical practice. And, and the reason for that also is that we can't leave drug allergy just in the hands of allergies and immunology specialists because of the huge burden and 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 the unmet need of allergy specialists, um, you know, globally. And as I as I've spoken to uh, colleagues in Sri Lanka, it's also obvious to me that there's an, a great unmet need of uh, allergy specialists um, in in your country as well. 
So I'm just going to uh, screen, share my screen, if I may, so that I can just uh, confirm that you all can um, see the slides. Uh, are you able to see the slides? Uh, yes, we can. Yeah. Uh, okay, lovely. So let me go but to the not slide. But not the, the presentation mode, uh, TK. Yes, yes, I'm just going to do that, yeah. Okay, I'm just going to adjust the screen so that I have a good visibility of what I'm showing. Okay. So, so I think, you know, it's, it's so, so given the unmet need of uh, uh, allergy, uh, I think it's really important that we all, uh, you know, we, we, we work together, okay? And, and I think it has to be a collaborative work, uh, which means that we all have to upskill ourselves, regardless of which discipline we come under, uh, to, to have a basic level of competence so that that crosstalk exists. We are able to confront uh, drug allergy labels and uh, try to ensure that we give the best possible care to our patients. This is really important. As much as it is important, not to administer a drug to a patient who is truly allergic. It's equally important to ensure that a patient is not deprived of essential treatment with the first line therapy, just because they have got a drug allergy labels, because you will, you will note during the course of my presentation that a vast majority or overwhelming majority of drug allergy labels are inaccurate. So therefore, I think we have to be really smart here. We have to develop some smart strategies, multi-pronged strategies, I would say, to, to be able to confront drug allergy labels and make sure that our patients are safe, they are protected, and they get the best possible treatment. So that's the aim of my presentation today. I, I know that we have a multidisciplinary, multi-professional audience on board here, and therefore I would like to make the presentation quite generic so that it just makes sense to everyone. So the main content of my presentation today is I want to tell you, you know, what is and what is not a drug allergy? What is the burden of drug allergy? What are the basic mechanisms that underpin drug allergy or drug hypersensitivity? And this is really important to have a basic level of knowledge for us to be able to, you know, develop that kind of approach that we need. Then I'm going to introduce you to some rather severe and rare severe drug allergic reactions. And that will be followed by a very simple clinical approach to drug allergy as a non-specialist, what should we do? And also introduce you to what we do as a specialist in drug allergy, and then throw in some illustrative cases, uh, which we come across in daily clinical practice, and then give you some key take-home messages, what I call as clinical pearls. And then in the end, wrap up the, uh, the presentation with what is called as rapid drug desensitization. And I'll talk about the topic at the end. I'm not going to do it now. So there's often a lot of confusion between drug allergy and adverse drug reactions. Okay. So it's really the drug allergy is a term that can be used very loosely. And that's one of the problems that we have. And we need to rectify that. So to understand what is drug allergy, drug allergy I think we need to go back one step and look at what are adverse drug reactions. Adverse drug reactions are reactions that you don't want patients to have. And these are reactions that are known to occur with certain drugs or take you by surprise, okay? So there are two types. Pharmacologically, you have two types of adverse drug reactions or ADRs. Type A is the predictable pharmacological reactions. That means that when we have all studied pharmacology, we know that there are certain uh, side effects that certain drugs can give. And we should not label patients with those side effects as drug allergy. Good example for that will be when you overdose someone with uh, morphine, opioids, you can get respiratory depression. And that particularly happens if you give it to someone with COPD. Or, you know, if you have, uh, if you warfarin uh, induced bleeding. So they are all pharmacological effects of, of drugs. They are not drug allergy. We all know that, but unfortunately, patients are still labeled or some patients take away that they are allergic and they will declare an allergy on the basis of these side effects. Therefore, confront the patient with further details is really important. Now, what we are interested also is about type B. They are immunological responses, host immunological responses to drugs. And some of them can have a genetic basis. And that's what we also call as hypersensitivity reactions. 
Okay, so the, so all the drug allergy, true drug allergy or true drug hypersensitivity are pharmacological type B adverse drug reactions. So the message from the slide is not all ADRs are drug allergy, but all drug allergy are ADRs. So drug allergy is a type of ADR. It's a type B ADR. So why does what are the common mislabeling scenarios? Okay, at least in the UK, we see lots of kids who had, uh, you know, who, who develop a rash uh, during antibiotic therapy. And as I'm, uh, you know, a physician seeing adult patients, and a lot of my patients ca carry a childhood label of drug allergy, and there's a lot of glandular fever in the UK, and patients are prescribed amoxicillin. And we know that in the context of an active EBV infection, amoxicillin can give you a generalized exanthematous rash, and that can get mislabeled as penicillin allergy or a virus-induced uh, rash by itself with any antibiotic uh, can also be labeled as a drug allergy. And I can understand why, because a family physician who's treating the patient has got no way to, to, to actually determine whether it's a true drug allergy or not. So to be on the safe side, to err on the cautious side, they will label the patient as drug allergy. But what is really annoying is that when patients develop GIT symptoms like diarrhea with amoxicillin or abdominal discomfort with macrolides, that is also labeled as drug allergy. The other quite uh, interesting phenomenon you see with opiates or with vancomycin particularly is that they, they can actually cause mast cells to release histamine. Okay, that's, their physiolo that's a physiological, pharmacological response to, to the drug. And patients can experience flushing. They can experience pruritus or erythema when these drugs are given, particularly when they're given rapidly. So some of you may have seen what is called as a red, man, red person syndrome, where when you give vancomycin rather fast in an infusion, patients can go red and sometimes they can even drop the blood pressure. They can have chest pain. They can have hypotension. And of course, you would think that that is anaphylaxis because at that stage, you don't know whether it's anaphylaxis or it's simple physiological response. And then hypotension that you get with uh, morphine or with opiates, particularly, you know, when people have spinal uh, anesthesia, you know, the, the, these all can be mislabeled as, as drug allergy. And sometimes that does cause problems. It causes significant impediment in delivery of good clinical care. So what is the burden? Now, if you look at adverse drug reactions in high-income countries, Three to six percent of all hospital admissions, you know, are associated with ADRs, and it's seen in about uh, ten to fifteen percent of hospitalized patients. That means you are admitted in the hospital, you are given treatment, and ten to fifteen percent uh, report ADRs, and about twenty-five percent of outpatients they report ADRs, not allergy, ADRs. And there's a huge burden of penicillin allergy. Uh, in, in, in the UK, about 6% of the general population in, the, in England and 10% of the population in the USA declare a penicillin allergy label. They are all, they're all unverified. And at any given time in high-income countries, particularly UK, USA, 15 to 20% of inpatients, they declare a penicillin allergy label, which is unverified. But if you look at published studies, 90 to 95 percent of the pension allergy labels are inaccurate. That means after thorough investigations, you can establish that the patient is clinically tolerant and they're not allergic. So that means out of 100 patients, 95 patients are carrying a spurious allergy label. And what are the consequences? The consequences are because there's no point of care test, like a cholesterol test, I can't take a drop of blood, send it to the lab and say yes, no. Because there's no point of care test, physicians would take a safe option of prescribing a less preferable broad-spectrum antibiotic. And we know from studies that there's an important risk factor for antimicrobial resistance. And just to put it into perspective, we have AMR rates are about 60 to 80 percent in India. Okay, 60 to 80 percent. So it's a huge public health problem. So I think we need to take the spurious pencil allergy labels rather seriously. Also, penne labels are associated with enhanced risk of surgical site. You know, patients post-operatively, they can develop infections uh, due to the pencil allergy label, okay? And also, it increases healthcare costs because patients stay longer in the hospital or they get readmitted. And all these things adds to uh, costs in an estimated several million uh, dollars per annum uh, 
uh, US dollars per annum. Okay, now this is one of the old studies some 20 years back. Uh, I think it was done in the Mayo Clinic. And this is just looking at a simple audit, looking at uh, over 2,000 patients who walked through the door in a specialist allergy clinic, declaring different allergies. And they were all investigated systematically. And what you can see is less than 20% were proven to be true allergy. And a vast majority of their caseload in a specialist clinic was beta lactams, was NSAID and general anesthesia. Okay, but after thorough investigations, less than 20% turned out to be true allergy. And what you can see is with general anesthetics, uh, usually they're, they're, you know, there's nearly half of them were true allergies. But if you look at beta lactams and NSAIDs, um, you know, most of them are, are inaccurate. Okay, so we did a study uh, early this year uh, with Professor Christopher in uh, CMC Velour in Tamil Nadu. And we looked at the prevalence of drug allergy labels in a tertiary pulmonary service, both inpatients and outpatients. What we did was we screened uh, 2,000 unselected patients, uh, both inpatients and outpatients. And this was done over six weeks uh, or eight weeks or so. And we had a questionnaire. We went through patients systematically uh, and sampled them randomly. And, and what you can see here is the uh, prevalence of drug allergy labels were nearly 6%. Okay, it's much less than what you see in high-income countries. Just to put it into perspective, in the UK, we have 6% of the general population uh, have got pencil allergy label, and at any given time, 15 to 20% of inpatients have got pencil allergy label. But what is really important here is that although the percentage is low, India has got a population of 1.4 billion. It has just overtaken China. So you can see the volume or the burden in terms of absolute numbers and if you then look at the number of allergy specialists to deal with this problem, they are rather few. So there's an overwhelming load of uh, drug allergy labels. And uh, the leading cause, at least in CMC, in that study, was antibiotics. More than half of the patients had a declared antibiotic allergy. And then that was followed by non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which are your painkillers and the radio contrast media, which are the dye used in, in radiology. And surprisingly, the leading cause within the antibiotic group was sulfonamides. I was expecting it to be penicillin, but it was sulfonamides. Okay. And I think about two to three percent of patients in this cohort, they declared uh, they declared allergy to multiple unrelated uh, drug classes. Okay, so we won't go into that. Now, this is a systematic review that we published, uh, I think a couple of years ago now, looking at multiple drug allergy and multiple drug intolerance syndromes. So let alone a patient declaring allergy to one drug, but if you have patients who declare allergy to multiple drugs, two or three drugs, uh, two or more drugs, then that becomes a real problem in delivering good care in the context of not having a point of care test. So what we found in the systematic review, but was that a large majority of this vast majority of these studies had unverified drug allergy labels. So we don't really know what proportion of these patients, and I suspect that a lot of them, probably 90% or more, very inaccurate drug allergy labels, but they were not investigated. However, what we also found out in the systematic review was that there were a small cohort of patients who can be truly allergic to multiple drugs. So don't dismiss when patients uh, tell you that they are allergic to multiple drugs, it is possible, okay? And why that happens to some patients and not to every patient is a million-dollar question. I wish I could answer that, but I don't. But this is something that we need to keep in the back of our mind so that we don't take the problem lightly, okay? So now let's just look at the clinical classification. So broadly, the uh, uh, Drug hypersensitivity reactions can be classified as immediate and non-immediate, and that's not rocket science. As the name suggests, immediate means that it happens immediately, although it's, the slide says one to six hours, I think most immediate reactions occur within an hour. And if you are giving an IV drug, it will happen even before you remove the syringe from the cannula, okay? So that's immediate hypersensitivity reaction or type one hypersensitivity reaction. However, most of the drug allergies that we see Patients report a reaction during a course of treatment, day two, day three, day four, day seven, maybe. And those are called non-immediate reactions. Okay. And there, that's a list there. And fortunately, most of the uh, 
majority of the non-immediate hypersensitivity reactions are restricted to skin and they are rather benign, just like a measles rash, maculopapular, exanthematous. However, sometimes you can get what is called a severe cutaneous adverse drug reactions. I'll show you some of the examples there. A few of them are listed in bullet points, and sometimes you can get organ injury as well. So it can be serious, and it can make your patient feel rather poorly in a non-immediate systemic hypersensitivity reaction. So let's just... Uh, slide is not moving. Uh, just one moment. Can you see the slides now? Kuani? Not on the screen, no. Sorry. No. Okay. Just one moment. Something has happened. Can you see now? Uh, yeah. Yes. Lovely. Sorry about that. So... This is the Gel and Coombs uh, classification of hypersensitivity reactions. And I hope uh, most of us are familiar. But just to go through it, you've got type 1 to type 4 hypersensitivity reactions. I will not go into all of them in detail. But what is really relevant for us for today is type 1 and type 4 hypersensitivity. Type 1 is immediate hypersensitivity reaction or IgE-mediated hypersensitivity reaction, IgA is an allergy antibody that your immune system produces and that is directed against specific allergen. For example, in penicillin allergy, you have an IgE antibody against the penicillin determinant, which causes the anaphylactic, anaphylactic reaction. And type 4 or delayed hypersensitivity reaction are T-cell mediated reactions. Uh, so they occur a bit later, usually after 24 hours. Typically, they occur about three to four days after the drug has you know has been administered or or while the drug is being taken type 2 and type 3 reactions are very rare so i will not go into that uh, type 2 is the igg mediated cytotoxic hypersensitivity reaction uh, sorry about the long name and type 3 is immune complex disease uh, like serum sickness as vas or vasculitis and they occur very rarely so we will not go into that but why is type 1 and type 4 relevant to this discussion. That is because not only that they are the most common true drug allergies, but also these are the two types of hypersensitive reaction that we can investigate with skin testing. Okay, and I'm going to talk about it a bit later during the presentation. Uh, TK, sorry, can you go to the, the presentation mode? Oh, right. Okay, sorry. So, so can you see the, I'll just leave it for a few seconds so you can see the so you can see that that's the mast cell this is the IgE antibody sticking on the mast cell and let's say that that is penicillin so your patient is penicillin allergic what happens is these two antibodies stick to this penicillin and they activate the mast cell they cause degranulation they release a lot of histamine and other mediators and that's is responsible for the pathophysiology of a delayed uh, of an immediate hypersensitivity reaction and this is the delayed hypersensitivity reaction in which the cd4 and cd8 t cells are involved and as i said that takes about uh, more than 24 hours typically you know uh, three to four days into treatment and as i said most of them are benign cutaneous reactions but sometimes you can have serious uh, delayed uh, systemic hypersensitivity reactions and the type 1 and type 4 reactions are amenable to skin tests. So that means using skin tests, we are able to make a diagnosis of type 1 and type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. So this is just going further into the pathophysiology of uh, type 1 reaction. Now, history is really important here. Now, the rapidity of symptoms and the type of symptoms depend upon how the patient is exposed to the drug. Like I said, if you are giving IV uh, treatment, uh, with penicillin, let us say, to a patient who has got penicillin allergy. You don't know that they had penicillin allergy. And as I said, even before you remove the syringe, the patient goes into anaphylaxis. And these patients usually go into cardiovascular anaphylaxis. That means they have 
complete shutdown, they drop, the blood pressure drops, you have a hypotensive crisis that may even lead to other cardiac problems, your patient may go into cardiac arrest, and so on. And there's very little time for the cutaneous uh, symptoms to occur because it's an IV administration. In contrast, when a patient is taking a capsule of amoxicillin, for example, it might take about 15 minutes or half an hour before the reaction manifests. And there, the, the most prominent manifestation will be cutaneous. The patient may get wheezing. They may get diarrhea, plus minus drop in blood pressure. And subcutaneous sits somewhere between oral and IV uh, in that you usually get all the all the manifestations, the cutaneous, the respiratory manifestations, and very rarely cardiovascular anaphylaxis. So, so it's really important to understand what is called as the temporal association. So how long has it taken before the symptoms manifest? And that's really important because mentally you want to ask, is this a true reaction? If it's a true reaction, is it an immediate reaction or is it a delayed reaction? So if your patient is telling you that I had a reaction after the very first dose of penicillin, you know that it is a IgE-mediated reaction. On the other hand, if the patient tells you that my symptoms occurred you know, day three, day four treatment, I took about 10 doses of amoxicillin, then you know that this is likely to be a non-immediate or a delayed T-cell mediated hypersensitivity reactions. It's very simple. It's not rocket science. But I think history taking is really, uh, you know, is, is a pillar here in terms of getting it right. So these are some pictures for you. Some of you may have seen in your practice. Uh, you can see typical pictures of urticaria, that usually occurs in type 1 hypersensitivity. You get large, blotchy, raised, uh, warm, and itchy eruptions. And alongside that, patients can also get some swelling of the soft tissue. Typically, it's the face because you've got loose connective tissue there. But what is really important is that if you get uh, involvement of the upper airway, then the patient can go into type 1 respiratory failure. So that's the, that's the problem with angioedema. Now, I'm going to switch to uh, the serious uh, uh, type 4 reactions. I'm sorry, some of these images are rather distressing. I apologize for that, but it's really important for us to understand the gravity of these systemic uh, delayed hypersensitivity reaction. What you see on the slide is a patient with toxic epiderma necrolysis at the bottom and the erythema multiforme at the top. So it's a spectrum. Er erythema multiforme sits on the extreme left. TEN or toxic epiderma necrolysis sits on the right in the spectrum. So you can have a continuum of the spectrum here with this type of reaction. You get target lesions in erythema multiforme. And if the patient develops a rather serious reaction, what we call as tense, then you get eosinophilic necrosis. The, 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 the epidermis have, has eosinophil influx, very little inflammation in the dermis. And as a result, what happens is the epidermis literally peels off. And that's where you're seeing the raw skin. And that's a biopsy there. You can see a lot of eosinophils and the epidermis is literally peeled off and with a rather minimal inflammation in the dermis. So this is a rather serious. And if you don't identify that, the patient can you know, go into ITU. They can develop sepsis due to secondary infection. This is a patient with Steven Johnson syndrome. Okay, And you can see here that usually patients develop a flu-like illness and it happens into the treatment course a few days after, maybe seven days or so. They get widespread tender lesions with typical oral involvement. You can see oral ulceration. You get what is called as the Nikolsky sign, where you just touch the skin and it peels off. Okay, You get severe desquamation. And what you can also get in, the, in, in SAS, you can get organ involvement. Your, li your liver function can be deranged. Patients can go into renal failure. You can have bone marrow abnormalities with cytopenias. Uh, you can have respiratory involvement, uh, with shadowing in the lungs. And if you took a look at the peripheral blood, you can get uh, the, the you, you you typically will you will not have eosinophilia and you will not get atypical lymphocytes. I'll tell you why that is important because we need to distinguish SAS from dress syndrome. Okay, and and what you see here on the right side is the common triggers and penicillins are everywhere. Penicillin can cause all sorts of reactions. You can see NSAIDs are other common culprits than other antibiotics, anti-gout drugs, anti-convulsants, anti-HIV drugs. And really, it's important. So, so, so for all clinicians or pharmacists in this, in this uh, 
meeting today, I think you need to keep an open mind. When you have a patient in the ward who is reporting a rash, always think of a drug reaction. But on the back of that, also think of infections, toxic shock syndrome, mycoplasma infections, bullous uh, uh, SLE, and paraneoplastic pemphigus, they can all uh, confound the picture. So they're all your differential diagnosis that you need to uh, bear in mind. So this is called DRESS syndrome. DRESS stands for drug reaction with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms. And what you see here, again, the patient will develop a generalized uh, mobiliform rash. And usually in DRESS syndrome, you've got fever, uh, more than 38. You'll have lymphadenopathy. You have involvement of at least one organ. Okay, and typically the blood counts, you get severe peripheral blood eosinophilia. Okay, the cutoff is about 1.5 or something, but usually it's more profound than that. You will get lymphocytosis and there are some international criteria. I'm not going into that. There's something called Regiska criteria and there's a Japanese consensus group diagnostic criteria for dress. And what you see on the left-hand side here is the different drugs, culprits, anticonvulsants typically are associated, antibiotics, I can see penicillin and sulfonamides, anti-HIV drugs, NSAIDs, and a lot of other drugs, you know, uh, they can all be associated. And and sometimes uh, they can be a coexistent HHV, HH, HHV 6 and cytomegalovirus infection. So we always screen patients for, for these infections when you have suspected dress syndrome. This uh, is uh, AGEP, acute generalized exanthematous postulosis. This is also a type of delayed reaction. And what you can see here, is uh, you get uh, studded pustules, but typically it is restricted to the cutaneous uh, compartment. Very rarely there's systemic involvement and then the skin peels off. And those are all the list of drugs that can be associated with AGEP. So as I said to you, uh, uh, fortunately, most of these uh, uh, non-immediate hypersensitivity reactions are, are benign, which are restricted to uh, a simple benign rash, but you can get uh, more severe involvement as you have seen in the previous slides. Now, this slide is uh, quite important. And what I want to show you here in the bottom right-hand panel is look at AGEP. Usually it occurs about three to five days after the patient starts treatment, right? And look at the, the maculopapular exanthemeter that usually can take about seven to 11 days, but SAS can take anything between two to uh, three weeks. And dress syndrome is very difficult to pick up usually because sometimes it can happen several, several weeks into treatment. So you need to have high index of suspicion to, to, to diagnose uh, dress syndrome. So now this is a, a systematic review. Um, and what you what I want to show you here uh, is about the, uh, the analysis of different studies that looked at pensionology. And the point I want to make here is, you know, you have maybe 20 studies or so in the systematic review, and all these patients were systematically investigated uh, with skin tests, with history, and 95% of them had negative testing. So this is just a proof to, to show you that uh, in high-income countries, 90 to 95% of patients with a pensionology label are actually spurious labels or inaccurate labels, okay? Now, the UK chief medical officer put antimicrobial resistance on the National Risk Register simply for that reason, okay? Because, you know, we have to reduce the unnecessary use of antibiotics, and I think that applies to all countries. I'm not sure what the situation is in Sri Lanka. And that is on the back of the United Nations having declared AMR as a high-priority area in its 2016 resolution. And over the last 10 years or so, you'll see that the, the, the literal proliferation of the number of papers regarding pensionology in the literature. So when you have time, go to PubMed and look it up, okay? And you'll see the number of papers. So people have taken this problem rather seriously. This is a study that we did at least about 10 years ago now uh, in, in our trust. And what we did was, it's very simple. We did a prospective study looking at uh, over 100 patients with a pencil allergy label on the wards, using a simple questionnaire, just talking to the patient, taking simple history. And 40% of the patients, simply by history, you could exclude pencil allergy. Then we did some cost analysis regarding the 
use of second line antibiotics in pencil allergy patients. And what we found was if a patient declares a pencil allergy label, they get an alternative antibiotic and that enhances the cost by 1.8 to 2.58 fold. And just to put that into perspective, this is 10 years ago, mind you. Uh, it costed our trust, which uh, at that time we had three hospitals in the trust, anything between 250 to 500,000 GBP per year. Okay, and that is not including overhead costs, hospital, you know, stay, beds, and all the other rest of it, just simply looking at the antibiotic costs. So that's the kind of uh, costs uh, that one could incur in the context of a pension allergy label. Now, just to switch to something more serious, um, we will be talking about this, uh, uh, you know, in, 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 in our third lecture. This is a simple study that we did. We asked as a regional center in Birmingham, and we received patients with suspected perioperative anaphylaxis. That means these patients have suffered from a severe crisis during in the operation theater when general anesthesia was administered. And what we did was we looked at over 100 patients here, and we could detect costs in about 83% of those patients. Um, and in among those patients, um, a vast majority were IgE mediated. And the point I want to make here is uh, nearly 50% of those patients, uh, I'm sorry, my slides are not moving again. Just want to, sorry about this. Can you see the slides now? Uh, yes. Yeah. So what you can see here is uh, among the patients who developed anaphylaxis, nearly 50% were due to antibiotics. Sorry. Were due to antibiotics and about 35% were due to neuromuscular blocking agents, which are the muscle relaxants that are given during general anesthesia. And what we found in the study, what's really important we found was about two neo, neo allergens that you know people were not aware of one is chlorhexidine other is patent blue dye chlorhexidine is a disinfectant i am sure you use it in sri lanka as well and uh, usually patients are exposed to chlorhexidine when you paint the skin before the operation um, and what is really important to bear in mind is chlorhexidine can be impregnated in central lines we had a patient recently who had fatal anaphylaxis due to chlorhexidine impregnated central line Okay, so they knew they were allergic to chlorhexidine, but the person who was uh, uh, doing the central line did not realize that the central line had chlorhexidine in it and the patient developed fatal anaphylaxis, unfortunately. The patent blue is a blue dye that is used for sentinel node mapping in breast cancer surgery, and that can cause refractory anaphylaxis. So that's really important. We'll go into the details uh, when I do the um, third presentation. I'm sorry, my slides are not moving. I just need to. Any suggestions why my slides are not moving? For this if you can you try with laptop cursor sometimes your uh, mouse won't work laptop cursor yes i tried with the cursor actually it's still not i'm just going to open my slides again and do it I apologize for the delay um
Right. So, so we talked about chlorhexidine and patent blue, and that's a really important message that I want to give you that, in you know, uh, when you have chlorhexidine allergy, be careful about the central lines. This is really important. There are quite a few cases reported in the literature with respect to that. And those of you, particularly allergists in this meeting, if you see patent blue anaphylaxis, uh, you know, it's really important to know that it can cause uh, refractory anaphylaxis. So that's really important. It can be a significant problem for the surgeon if they can't use patent blue dye for sentinel lymph node mapping during breast cancer surgery. Okay, let's now go to the diagnosis of drug allergy. As I said to you, it's really important to take a good clinical history. You need to review clinical records to make sure that uh, you know the patient's allergy label is true. What are the circumstances surrounding the index episode, what were the symptoms associated, what is the temporal association, and then ask the question, you know, does this patient really have an allergy? Does this patient require allergy tests? And then apply the tests appropriately so you can have maintain the value of the allergy tests. And I'll talk, you, I'll talk to you about the provocation tests in a moment. So, so these are the way, you know, so, so history is important. Review of records is important, and then you apply skin testing. Okay, I'll go through the skin testing in a moment. The in vitro test, there are a number of things. We do specific IgE, we do something called basophil activation test, the lymphocyte transformation test, and the simple message to you is, you know, they don't give good results, really. So we rely heavily on skin testing, and you need to use the skin testing smartly in the context of the clinical presentation, because one key message I want to give you today is that we don't know the negative predictive value of skin tests to most drugs, okay? Therefore, when a skin test is negative, I cannot cross my, my uh, heart and say to the patient that you are definitely not allergic. And that's why we then do what is called the drug provocative testing. So that means we do a skin test, we have the history, we show the skin test is negative, and then we carefully uh, do a challenge test um, after explaining to the patient the potential risk for allergic reactions. And in my experience, if you choose your patients correctly for challenge tests, that means that these are patients who are very unlikely to have had an immune-mediated reaction and their skin tests are negative, then usually you don't run into problems. If at all the patient develops a reaction, it will be a mild rash or something, but not anaphylaxis. So, so I think if you're systematic in your approach, uh, you can delabel most, if not all, patients successfully. So skin testing involves two steps. One is called the prick test, another is called the intradermal test. The prick test involves putting drops of the solutions of interest, penicillin or whatever other drug you're checking. You need to have a negative control. You need to have a positive control. The negative control is usually saline. The positive control is histamine. And then you wait for 15 minutes to look at a wheel and fair response. If it's more than three millimeter wheel greater than the negative control, then that's deemed positive. And then if the skin prick test is negative, you do an intradermal test where you inject a really tiny drop, 0.03 to 0.5 ml into the, into the dermis. And then you uh, wait for a response at 48 to 72 hours, something very similar to what you do in a, in a MANTU test. And what you're looking there is an erythema, an infiltrated erythema of more than five millimeters at 48 to 72 hours, and that indicates a positive reaction. Now, uh, this is a very important paper. Those of you who are uh, practicing skin tests in Sri Lanka, you may want to look at this paper. What this tells you is the concentrations and non-irritant concentrations of various drugs that can be used uh, for skin testing. What it, what you mean by NIC or non-irritant concentration is a concentration of the, or, or, or the dilution of the drug that you need to use to ensure that you don't get false positive results simply due to skin irritation, okay? So I would urge you to look at this paper. This is from the YACI, European Academy of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. And that's what we use in our clinic. So in recent times, uh, uh, this is a paper I did with Siraj Misba in Oxford, and and uh, the direct amoxicillin challenge, you know, that's becoming uh, increasingly uh, uh, acceptable among specialists uh, in UK and other countries. Simply because of the volume of cases, we don't have the resource to be able to undertake skin tests in all our patients. So if you stratify your patients as low risk and high risk on the basis of the history, low risk patients are those 
who uh, most unlikely to have had an immune mediated reaction that means your history is telling you that's very unlikely they're going to have a true allergy then you can simply circumvent the skin test step and go directly to challenge i'll talk to you about this next week so this uh, you can apply in a significant proportion of patients and and delabel and what we are now doing in the uk is encouraging our uh, non allergy specialists healthcare professionals pharmacists and other uh, allied medical specialities to adopt this procedure so they can delabel their own patients but this of course requires some training as well so we can talk about this uh, next week so just to pause here and for a moment i want to reiterate once more that the predictive value of skin tests are not known so therefore you have to you know be careful uh, in not getting carried away that a negative skin test is uh, is enough to reassure your patient now as i said you take a good history and a negative skin test and then you do the challenge procedure and before you undertake the challenge procedure always step back and do a risk benefit analysis uh, and explain to your patient the potential risk of uh, allergic reaction and document that uh, in the notes uh, for medical legal reasons so this is uh, uh, a 15 year old boy with a 3 day history of fever sore throat and cervical adenitis they were prescribed penicillin uh, amoxicillin 500 mg 3 times a day and they developed a rash uh, after 24 to 48 hours so of course you would stop amoxicillin in this patient and prescribe an alternative give them symptomatic relief and the main differential diagnosis here is an infection induced rash or and of course you can't exclude a non immediate hypersensitivity reaction so in this case you can probably you know uh, consider direct oral challenge um you know usually these patients present to you about 10 or 15 years later and in our, in our experience you are able to delabel these patients without too much difficulty this is a patient this is a very common scenario at least in the uk 60 year old man four episodes of lip and tongue swelling in the last four months requiring emergency admission and they have a background history of diabetes ischemic heart disease and hypertension they are on metformin ischemic uh, atenolol for ihd aspirin and then ramipril and all these drugs they have been taking for over 10 years okay and when you take the history the patient has not taken any new medications and there's nothing else in the time frame to cause type 1 hypersensitivity reaction and what is really important here is the patient did not develop urticaria they developed isolated angioedema and the and the most likely diagnosis here is ace inhibitor induced angioedema uh angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors induce angioedema this is not an allergic reaction this does not happen after every single administration but it's really important to stop uh ac inhibitors in these patients and use an alternative to uh to treat their hypertension also differential diagnosis is that uh, you need to exclude a very rare form of primary immune deficiency called c1 stress inhibitor deficiency which can be done by checking their c4 and c1 stress inhibitor levels so this is a, a, an example of an episode that can mimic an allergy a drug allergy but is not a true drug allergy okay i'm just going to the next case in in the interest of time this is another googly i would say uh, those of you interested in cricket uh, this is a 25 year old patient that a back pain was prescribed ibuprofen 400 mg tds and approximately 3 hours after the first dose they developed chest tightness and and dry cough which uh, did not bother them very much so they took the next dose and 2 hours they later developed severe wheeze chest tightness and cough there's no urticaria there's no hemodynamic compromise so this patient has uh, perineal rhinitis they can't smell very well they've got nasal blockage uh, for which they take treatment with antihistamines and nasal spray and they take regular treatment for asthma so this is a case of samters triad with aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease the patient has got asthma they got nasal polyposis and they got aspirin allergy and here the take home message for you today is that aspirin allergy is non ig mediated so there's no role for skin test there's no role for uh, intradermal test this is a a, a a a a scenario where you make a clinical diagnosis and the patient has to avoid aspirin and all nsaids because it is a class effect okay so this is really important
The last case is a 65-year-old patient who underwent laparoscopic, uh, who was posted for a laparoscopic cholecystectomy under general anesthesia. And soon after, they were given induction with fentanyl, propofol, rocuronium, and comoxiclav. All within a few minutes, they went into severe anaphylactic shock with hypotensive crisis, desaturation, and flushing. Okay. So we checked their serum tryptase, which is a specific marker for anaphylaxis. And soon after, you can see it went up to 100 micrograms per mil per liter. And then the following day, it came right down to eight. So this is a case of uh, perioperative anaphylaxis. We did skin prick tests to all the agents, including latex and chlorhexidine. They were all completely negative. So we went on to do an intradermal test, and we showed that the culprit was rocuronium. You can see that the wheel diameter increased from 5 to 12. All the other drugs were completely negative. So the advice we were able to give this patient was that they should avoid rocuronium and alternatives such as atracurium and cisatracurium could be used. And we also did a penicillin challenge for this patient to show that they are not penicillin allergic. And they were given a medicolored bracelet stating they have got rocuronium allergy. They were given a letter to take home and their letter and their records were updated uh, in the hospital. So that's what we did. So I'm just going to skip this slide in the interest of time. So I think I have made a case that careful clinical history is terribly important. Scrutiny of clinical records about what drugs were given, what doses, what temporal association, what symptoms is really important. And also evaluate whether or not the patient had systemic involvement and you need to characterize their clinical presentation with respect to whether it's immediate or non-immediate hypersensitivity. Then you stop the suspect drugs, you refer the patient to a specialist who can investigate, and then you have to ask the question, you know, is this a hypersensitivity reaction? Can I do skin testing on this patient? And can I do a drug provocative test? Now, one important message also for you is that if a patient has Steven Johnson syndrome or dress syndrome or TENS, we usually don't undertake skin tests in those patients unless it's absolutely essential because there are rare cases where you can trigger these severe reactions with the skin test itself. So usually it represents a relative contraindication. And you'd also agree with me that having basic knowledge in hypersensitive reactions and immune mechanisms of drug allergy is really paramount for us to confront drug allergy labels. So just uh, spend a couple of minutes uh, on rapid drug desensitization. So what do I do if I have a patient who gives a history of penicillin anaphylaxis, a clear history of penicillin anaphylaxis, and they require treatment for syphilis in pregnancy, or they require uh, treatment for neurosyphilis for which only penicillin can be used, or a patient with severe pulmonary tuberculosis who has anaphylaxis to uh, rifampicin, for example, what, what can you do for these patients? So this is where there's a role for what is called as a rapid drug desensitization. That means that you can expose the patient with a really tiny dose of the implicated drugs, usually 10 to the power minus six or something, and over 15 to 20 minutes or half an hour, escalate the dose in a stepwise fashion until you use the therapy, until you reach the therapeutic dose okay by doing so what you do is you switch the immune system from an allergic mode to a more tolerant mode and induce what is called as t-cell tolerance uh, immunological tolerance and then they are able to tolerate the medication for the required period of time so what is really important here is that when you do rapid drug desensitization the patient can tolerate the drug as long as they are regularly exposed to the drug Say if you discontinue the drug or they stop the drug for a few days, they become allergic again. So you have to repeat the procedure all over again. And this needs to be done under one-to-one -one supervision, preferably in a high dependency unit or intensive care unit, so that if the patient does run into anaphylaxis, then you know uh, that you have got all the resources to treat the patient. So th those are all the different indications, as I said, syphilis in pregnancy, neurosyphilis, we, bacterial endocarditis, we've done quite a few of these in our hospital, tuberculosis, cancer chemotherapy, where you need to give some essential biologic to a patient uh, as a life-saving treatment. And of course, aspirin in aspirin-sensitive asthma and aspirin in nasal polyps. And sometimes we get referrals from cardiology unit for patients who require dual uh, antiplatelet therapy and they need aspirin to protect their cardiac stent. So these are all the different... Uh, indications. And here is an example. 
you can see that uh, this procedure takes about uh, four hours approximately. You start off with a really tiny dose and uh, go to the uh, therapeutic dose in a systematic fashion. Okay, so that's about the rapid drug desensitization. So again, as I said, the tolerance status is lost within a few days after, after discontinuing the medication, but it is really useful in as a life-saving treatment for patients who got type 1 hypersensitivity or anaphylaxis to some of the drugs. I'll close with this slide. The most important thing in all this is first do no harm. And we all taken as doctors have taken oath uh, to say that we'll protect our patients. So in the so I think this is really important. Safety comes first before you do anything for your patient. And and I'll stop there and I'm happy to take questions and thank you for listening. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Professor Krishna. Thank you very much for enlightening us on uh, drug allergy. I think uh, there are a few questions on the in the the chat box, and there may be like uh, other audience might uh, have uh, more questions. Can I ask uh, uh, Danushka to uh, moderate Danushka the questions? Yes, madam. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Krishna, for that interesting uh, lecture. Actually, we had uh, more participants than we anticipated, so that means this topic is uh, very timely and interesting to uh, our doctors. Um, there are a few questions. Um, uh, one question is that um, now, uh, once a patient uh, undergoes a skin test and uh, say labeled as uh, the skin test is positive, uh, now, uh, certain allergies don't last a life, uh, don't last life long. So, uh, is there any place for retesting after some time? Yeah, so we uh, normally retest. Um, so, uh, you're right. I think there are two important points here. We don't know how long it takes for someone to grow out of an allergy, and we don't know who will grow out of an allergy. So, generally. Uh, we discharge patients after we complete the uh, uh, investigations and we give, give advice. We don't bring back the patient uh, later on unless unless we have a strong degree of suspicion that the patient is allergic and our tests were not uh, sensitive enough to pick it on that occasion. Then what I do is I bring the patient back in three to four months to repeat the test in that scenario. And that's quite rare. So the simple answer to your question is it's a one-stop shop. So that means that, you know, the patient comes, we get everything done, and then we send them home with a letter uh, with a clear answer as to, A, did we establish the cause? Is this a drug allergy? What are the drugs that the patient should avoid? What are the alternatives? So, but we don't bring back the patient. We don't repeat the test. And it's just selective, very rare to do that. Okay. Thank you. Um, the other thing is now, um, uh, we discussed with you already that we have a, a, a problem with drug allergies these days. And now a lot of cases are being reported, whereas not many cases were reported earlier. So now um, people are coming up with the scenarios where uh, the patient has been on a oral antibiotic for a prolonged time, say like few days. And then uh, all of a sudden, when they're converted to IV of the same intravenous of the same drug, then they develop reactions. Is that possible? Is there a special thing that you should look for? Hey, I have heard about this, uh, but I don't think there's anything published in the literature, as far as I'm aware, that a patient will become more sensitive to something when it is given in the IV route. Uh, as opposed to, uh, uh, you know, them tolerating it orally, okay? So uh, that is uh, something that I've heard occasionally from people, but I don't think there's any hard evidence. One thing that I would, however, say is that if that happens to a patient, then what I would do is I would look at the list of excipients in the, in the, in the, in the oral and the IV drug, just in case the patient reacted to the excipient rather than the active component. Because, you know, the COVID crisis has uh, alerted us about polyethylene glycol allergy. I'm sure you have come across that in your country as well, PEG allergy. And what we were dismissing some years ago, oh, oh, this is not something that I would like to investigate. Now you take it more seriously because rarely you know that patients can react to experience. So what I will do in such cases is you know, I know in the back of my mind that from an immunological perspective, 
the patient cannot be, uh, become uh, allergic to the active component because they only tolerated the amoxicillin a few hours back. So what I will do is I will take help from my pharmacist colleagues to look at the excipients and then see if there's anything that's different between the two preparations and see whether that might be the cause. And what you might also want to do in such cases is if it's a really essential treatment, you might want to give the patient the oral drug again. It all depends upon the individual circumstances and how severe the reaction was. But what you would also do in such cases is actually probably undertake skin testing to show whether or not there's evidence of uh, you know, immediate or delayed hypersensitivity reaction. If it's all negative, then undertake the oral provocation test. But that's very rare indeed. Very rare. I've never seen, I mean, I'm practicing drug allergy as I said to you for nearly 20 years now. And uh, I have not come across a patient with that scenario, although I've heard from colleagues that they have seen some. Can you elaborate on some of the excipients that are found commonly in, on, in these drugs? Yeah. So the only excipient I can immediately think of is polyethylene glycol. And polyethylene glycol is also called macrogol, and they've got different molecular weights, and people have reported in the context of COVID vaccines that some of these reactions are dependent on the molecular weight. So that's something I, I don't understand very clearly, but they're rather few, far and few in between. But I would just, I, I can't think of other excipients. Maybe there are some E numbers in certain drugs, but E numbers are usually there in oral drugs rather than IV drugs. So the only thing I can think of is two things, polysorbate, AT, and polyethylene glycol, and polysorbate 80 is present in every other medication. So I have not seen polysorbate 80 induced allergy. And people were also talking about cross reactivity between polysorbate 80 and macrogol. I have not seen that either. So this is a rather challenging scenario that you are describing, for which it's very hard to come up with an immunological explanation, particularly for hypersensitivity to the active component given via a different route. Um, you spoke about uh, the uh, COX inhibitor intolerance and SAMP test tried in your presentation. So when a, pres a patient uh, presents with, uh, say, a, a reaction following diclofenac sodium, is there a particular um, uh, NSAID that you challenge the patient with? Yeah. So so now, if the if we don't undertake a challenge, if the clear history is clearly suggestive, okay. So what we do is, for example. If someone has got osteoarthritis, they really require something for pain, right? And they've had an allergic reaction to diclofenac, then I might consider using COX, selective COX-2 inhibitor. But those drugs, you know, there are two things there. One is selective COX-2 inhibitors are safe in patients with NSAID intolerance uh, as long as the symptoms are mucocutaneous. If they had anaphylaxis, then you should not be using selective COX-2 inhibitor. Second, is selective COX-2 inhibitors are associated with thromboembolic episodes. So I would not encourage someone to take selective COX-2 inhibitor for a long time. So from an allergy viewpoint, it might be safe for the patient to take celecoxib or rofecoxib or whatever uh, from, you know, in terms of clinical tolerance. But I think it's important to speak to their family physician or general physician to make sure that they don't have risk factor for thromboembolic. And just to highlight that as a risk. Um, uh, so in the literature, generally, it says that um, um, anaphylaxis to aspirin is rare. Is that so? I mean, we have come across yeah. cases where uh, it sounds like anaphylaxis, but the literature says uh, yeah. it's very rare or, I mean, rather unreported. So uh, what is your view on that? So my view on that is it depends on what definition you use to call what is anaphylaxis. Now, if you apply the WAO diagnostic criteria for anaphylaxis, then they are quite strict. So you need to have two system involvement. So most reactions to aspirin are either respiratory or they are cutaneous, and rarely there are cutaneous and respiratory. So if you have cutaneous and respiratory together, then that meets the diagnosis of uh, diagnostic criteria for anaphylaxis. But if you have got isolated bronchospasm, that's not anaphylaxis. If you had mucocutaneous involvement with upper airway, that's also not anaphylaxis. So I agree to some extent that anaphylaxis, as per the WO criteria, is very rare with aspirin. Okay, But 
occasionally there's they say never say never in medicine so 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 you know i think i would say it's exceedingly rare so most uh, patients with uh, aspirin nsaid intolerance we don't call it allergy we call it intolerance um because it's non ig mediated we used to call it anaphylactoid now that term has gone out of the window so we call it intolerance they usually and fortunately mucocutaneous and uh, respiratory they are usually not cardiovascular unless unless your patient has got mastocytosis if your patient has got mastocytosis then they have got an enhanced risk of anaphylaxis because they have got a huge mast cell burden in their body okay but that again mastocytosis is quite a rare condition um uh, the next question is also in the chat box it's a, a practical uh, i think faced by many clinicians so what happens in a country like ours is that uh, when uh, people go to doctor uh, go to the doctor they are given uh, certain medications from the gp practice and sometimes on top of that they take various herbal medicines also and when they get a reaction they come to the uh, hospital again and say that they developed this reaction and you end up with this whole heap of uh, both western and herbal medicine so in such a situation is there like any method you can suggest to uh, I mean, unravel what the allergen is. Very difficult. Fortunately, we don't have that trouble in the UK, so uh, that's my escape on that. In but India, I, but I know, I know. But if you look at the Chinese literature, have you seen the Chinese literature? There's quite a lot of uh, patients with anaphylaxis to Chinese remedies. So mm -hmm. I would not take it lightly, because they may be some of them may be allergenic, and some of them are plant derived. so you know uh, and if the patient is atopic and has got other sensitization there may be cross reactivity so as long as uh, the the products are safe uh, with respect to you know uh, their preparation and all that you might want to undertake skin testing but again the problem there is you don't have any non irritant concentrations and if you got something in the form of tablets how are you going to do a skin test they may not disperse and even if they disperse well what concentration are you going to use uh, you can't just grab someone from the corridor and uh, use them as controls that's not ethical so it is rather difficult but i would take it case by case basis and and where there's an opportunity i would do a prick test for example if you do it a prick test and if you had quite a big wheel with pseudopodia and all that then you know that that's uh, that's significant on the other hand if you have another culprit like penicillin and everything else is negative then you know you got your culprit so it's very unlikely that the patient would be allergic to the other drugs that they may have taken that would yes. be my approach yes um uh, in your presentation you said that there are some certain tests that you can do in drug allergies so there is a question in the chat box asking whether there is uh, absolutely no role in bat for antibiotic allergy no no uh, i think i think it depends upon your setup now bat has not been bat is called for others in the in the in the room bat is the base of lactation test and it is an alternative test where you actually take the patient's peripheral blood you incubate it with the active drug that you're testing for and then you uh, look at the basophil expression using two markers usually it's cd63 and cd203c that's you see for basophils and you compare the basophil activation as per the expression of these markers on the surface of basophil before and after now the problem with this bat is that the you have to validate the test in your lab first of all so you need to know what is the sensitivity specificity negative predictive value positive predictive value so that itself is a massive undertaking second you need to have equipment you need to have trained personnel who are good in flow cytometry and it's a rather expensive test so therefore at least in the nhs we don't use bat has got no place in routine clinical service the other test that we i mentioned in my slide for completeness was lymphocyte transformation test this has been in the literature for god 40 years or whatever and i think that is still being used as a research tool we don't use it in day to day practice so at the moment in my clinic we use the skin test we use a prick test and we do intradermal test and what we do is in order to maintain the high uh, predictive value of the test and high yield of the test we are very systematic in the way we go through the clinical history 
we sit with a group you know we have an mdt at the end of each week and we sit we discuss the patient and we ask the all the basic questions and then offer the skin test so that we know whether we are applying the test appropriately and when we do apply the test we know what we are going to do with a positive or a negative so that's really important that's why i said right at the top of my presentation that you know it's a daunting topic because you don't have a handle on the test you don't have a point of care test so you need to use your skin test smartly that's the only thing you've got I agree. Um, uh, so, uh, sorry, I'm jumping from topic to topic because I see all these interesting questions popping up in the chat box. Uh, there is another question regarding uh, desensitization uh, with aspray. So, if uh, we get actually, it's a common uh, question that is asked by the, uh, by, especially from us, uh, by the cardiologist. So they want patients to be desensitized when they are awaiting uh, uh, PCIs uh, in the uh, hospitals. So um, now there are, like you said, they can present with cutaneous and respiratory symptoms. So if a, a patient presents with, now we know that anaphylaxis is a contraindication to this aspirin desensitization. So what if uh, a patient presents with cutaneous plus respiratory symptoms and you are not entirely sure that it's anaphylaxis in such a situation what would you yeah. do very good question very interesting question and i can see they must have struggled with that patient so uh, what we have done is you know fortunately these patients are in coronary care okay but what is really uh, important is that they've just had an mi and they would need a stent so they are not hemodynamically stable and they've just been commenced on a beta blocker okay so, which means that if they do have anaphylaxis, potentially the beta blocker might interfere uh, with the uh, efficacy of adrenaline. So, these are all the variables that one need to consider. But despite all that, I think what we have done is we have been quite courageous enough to uh, desensitize the patient. And touch wood so far, we've been okay. I have not had any patient because most of these patients have had the reaction long time ago. And and I, I have not seen true anaphylaxis, by the way. I have seen patients with some kind of indeterminate history, uh, maybe a bit of bronchospasm, uh, urticaria, maybe slight throat tightness, that kind of thing. I have not seen patients with a full-blown anaphylaxis to aspirin. So in those cases, because the patient needs, otherwise you're going to deprive the patient of a stent. Okay, so I think you need to, you and, and what we do is, we have a clear chat with the cardiologist. We explain to them the unquantifiable risk. This is a really important expression, unquantifiable. Usually the doctors will ask you, okay, what's the chance of having anaphylaxis? I can't tell. How can I say it's 50%? How can I say it's 10%? How can I say it's 90%? I can't. So that's unquantifiable. These patients are in the coronary care unit. But mind you, you are going to start with a small dose. You're not giving them 75 milligram. You're not giving them 300 milligram. You're starting them at 2.5 or 5 milligram or something or 1 milligram. I don't know. the. I can't remember the protocol. And you're gradually increasing the dose. So if the patient does react, you can either stop the procedure or go back a few steps and come back again. And in our limited experience over a few years now, we have not had anyone run into problems. And there are some nice papers. I can send you some of the papers if you want. You can read them and that might give you more confidence. But in all these, very important to document in the notes and tell the patient, tell the cardiologist about this. Because I don't, you don't want to excite them to say, that, oh, it's all fine, they're desensitizing and the allergy is cured. That's not the case. There's a risk. This is a risky procedure in a risky circumstance. So that's really important. Yes. Um, so um, uh, uh, so patients who came to us with uh, a clear history of uh, uh, bronchial asthma or allergic rhinitis, we have uh, desensitized even if they had cutaneous and respiratory. But when the uh, history of the respiratory symptoms is not quite clear, then we are sort of left in the doubt whether it was actually anaphylaxis. So those patients we have been very uh, careful to handle and uh, we might not have desensitized some of them as well. But that's um, the right thing to do. That's the right thing to do you are conscious but what happens in these things is over a period of time you will gain confidence as you do more 
Um, another question asked is now we have these patients uh, with, uh, especially the SAM test child, who can't tolerate even paracetamol. So yes. in such a situation, uh, what would you do uh, if they get fever? Uh, you have to avoid because uh, because paracetamol we you know if if the history is somewhat indeterminate we have challenged them but we have had patients who have reacted to paracetamol and there are a cohort of patients who got dual NSAID and paracetamol allergy uh, i don't know how that happens i don't know the exact mechanism but it can happen so don't dismiss it and in that case you just have to uh, you know find some other uh, uh, pragmatic way of managing the fever Yes. Um, yeah, so we have um, 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 some more questions. I don't know how uh, how much time do you have to answer? I'm okay. Uh, I'm okay. Okay. I'm okay. okay. Uh, yeah, one question uh, asked here is uh, regarding the uh, timing of uh, collecting samples for trip taste test. So in our practice, we try to, I mean, it's not freely available to us and it's very costly for us to do. So uh, what we do is actually at MRI, where I'm working, we tell uh, the clinician to take the first sample uh, 15 minutes after the onset of symptom before completion of three hours and send the second sample 24 hours after the first sample. So I know that there are uh, other protocols as well. Um, so what would you say the best time to collect uh, uh, blood for trip taste test? I think it's fine given given the cost implications i think what you're doing is fine i think the key thing to remember here is the half life of trip taste is about 2 hours 1.5 to 2 hours and the the levels tend to decline significantly at 6 hours they usually come back to baseline by 24 hours so in the uk what we do is we don't put pressure on the doctor because we know how busy they are in the emergency departments so what we do is as soon as the patient is clinically stabilized we ask them to take a sample that usually happens at one hour and then we ask them to take a second sample uh, uh, within four hours but not later than six hours and then we take a third sample at 24 hours but i can tell you for sure we have done about three or four studies now the second sample usually doesn't arrive you'll be lucky to get one acute sample and you'll be really lucky to get one within four hours and it really helps it really, really helps because if your acute serum tryptase is elevated, right, uh, then it is anaphylaxis. It's nothing else. It in, it shows that there's mast cell activation. So it's such a specific test for anaphylaxis. But what you're doing is absolutely fine. I think you're really, really doing better than what we are doing in the UK to get sample at 15 minutes. I've never seen a sample at 15 minutes. <laughs> No, uh, actually, we say uh, to avoid the first 15 minutes uh, so that we allow the uh, trip taste to build up before we sample. Yeah. Uh, so generally, they what they do is they uh, if they are sending, they generally send a sample after they resuscitate the patient. Um, do you have any experience regarding uh, trip taste uh, measurement in post-mortem uh, yeah. tests? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So that's a very tricky business. Um, we actually did a review published in Frontiers in Immunology. It's freely available uh, on the web. If you look at Frontiers of Immunology, we published a paper about three years ago about biomarkers in anaphylaxis. I can't remember which year, but you'll find it. And there are a few things about postmortem tryptase that one has to. There's, 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 it's, it's a tricky thing with respect to what is a cutoff. Okay. Now, there are a few bullet points I would like to share with you. One is that the levels are altered after cardiopulmonary resuscitation because of the cardiac damage. And you know, the myocardium has got lots of mast cells there. So simple CPR might cause a raise in tryptase. Okay. Second, you know, if the patient is already on aspirin, that might also skew the results somewhat. Now, you get better results if you get a femoral sample <laughs> rather than sample from elsewhere uh, in a post-mortem. That's important. And the, lo the longer it takes to get a post-mortem sample, the more spurious the result is going to be due to putrefaction, due to uh, you know tissue put putrefaction. Despite all that, all, invariably, you're going to have, you know, you're never going to have a perfect sample because each patient, unfortunately, you know, the circumstances are rather unfortunate. 
uh, and sometimes you don't know the exact circumstances surrounding the history and all that. And in anaphylaxis, you don't get any typical postmortem signs because you know you know they you might get some lung congestion or something, but otherwise you're not going to see the rash, you're not going to see the laryngeal edema. Okay, but I think the value of tryptase becomes. I would start getting excited when it when it is more than sixty micrograms per liter. And more than 100 makes it very likely. I think those are the key things with postmortem tryptase. But uh, uh, when you're writing your report, you'll always put a sentence in the end to say that you can never be sure. What about timing of uh, sampling? Uh, how soon should they do the uh, postmortem? Uh... Uh, as soon as possible. They get a sample. They can do the PM later, but just provide you with a sample. Uh -huh. Probably with Isn't a sample, a, uh, spin it ceiling, and ceiling. Uh, ceiling. I mean, uh, like a maximum no. duration. Or no, no, no. But actually, what you can see, there's a protocol from the Royal College of Pathologists. You might find it on their website. Yes. So, in in any sudden death, you should ask them to collect a sample for tryptase. So, if you did that in all patients, then if the question of the uh, you know the the anaphylaxis arises then you know that you got a sample which has been taken uh, you know appropriately but if they think about it quite you know down the line a few days later then the chances of getting a, a proper measurement is going to be very thin so i don't think we have uh, uh, received more than one in one or two samples that were fit enough to run through the machine so we always get uh, um, uh, samples that are, you know, that we just can't run through the machine. Uh, um, the, uh, there are a few other patients, actually, uh, this, uh, this practice I'm talking about is actually older than me, I suppose. So uh, there is a practice in our wards where before giving any antibiotic, they do a, a sort of like intradermal test um, to see whether the patient is sensitized or not. And sometimes uh, we get patients saying that the patient now, uh, this could be a patient who is on IM uh, penicillin for a long time. And before each injection, they are sometimes tested with this method. And then we get referrals asking us uh, the ST or they call it the ST. ST is positive. Now, what do we do? So the patient, the last dose the patient has tolerated. Now, uh, this time they come with positive some sort of a skin test and we are supposed to comment on that and also they use this practice for whatever the IV antibiotic they give so uh, what is your view on that the answer is simple you don't need to do a skin test uh, or any allergy test for patients before you give them antibiotics so long as you ask the question and if you document in your uh, in your record that there's no history of allergy or drug allergy or pencil allergy, which is a good clinical practice to ask patients before you do. So if the patient does not declare anything and there's nothing in their clinical record to state that they are allergic, then I don't think we uh, we don't have we don't uh, test them, and I don't think any international guideline asks you to routinely undertake skin tests to all patients before antibiotic therapy. Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing is. I don't think the positive predictive value of a skin test is 100%. That means you can have people who are positive on, on testing, like, you know, with foods and other things where you can be sensitized but not clinically reactive. The third point is it also depends upon what is uh, the uh, non-irritant concentration they are using for intradermal test and, and with due respect, what is their technique and how are they interpreting the test? Because, you know, even in trained hands, sometimes the reproducibility of these tests are not great. And therefore, I think all these things can muddy the waters. And therefore, the simple thing to do will be not to do the test and simply have a very good clinical practice to say, I will ask my patient, are they allergic or not? If they say no, that's good. I'll document it. And as a, as a good clinician or a good practice, I will look at the record whatever I can lay my hands on to see whether someone has documented anything about allergy. If that's not the case, then I think 
it would be prudent to give the patient antibiotics without delay, particularly in the context of sepsis or something, where if you potentially delay your antibiotic treatment, your clinical outcomes are going to be poor, particularly in the context of sepsis. So therefore, it's really important that, uh, you know, that you need to maintain a balance, don't you? So it's about, it's about education, 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 so that, you know, you remove the myth and then you you know, you 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 lay down some guidelines. So I think it just requires some kind of. Uh, I, this happens in India. The last few times I've been to India in conferences, I've had this question every single talk to say that uh, do we need to do skin testing before giving penicillin? Routinely, the answer is no. Thank you very much for that. So that's a message uh, we are also trying to uh, get across to our clinicians. Um, so in the interest of time, I think we'll stop there. We have some more questions regarding antibiotic allergy and various other drug allergies, which I think we can answer during the subsequent lectures. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Professor TK. Um, I don't know whether uh, Professor Guernilianeke, uh, Madam, if you would like to conclude the meeting. I know, carry on, Danushka. Um, I, um, I think uh, we will stop here, madam. Uh, so the uh, other pending questions, I think we can take up in the subsequent lectures, madam. When is the next uh, lecture, Danushka? We can tell the audience. Uh, uh, Wednesday, next Wednesday, 20, uh, 23rd of August, uh, same time. Um, so, uh, the next topic I think you're going to deal with uh, mainly antibiotic allergy, uh, isn't it, uh, Professor Krishna? I can't remember the title, but I think it's something like uh, the burden of, uh, tackling the burden of pensionology in high-income countries or something. I think that's yeah. that's the title as far as I can recall. Uh, hopefully, that is that something that you like or you want that, you know, fine-tuned, uh, to your requirements in Sri Lanka, I'm very happy to do so. Just send me an email as to what you are expecting in that, so I can, you know, I can try to make it more useful to you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I will communicate with you uh, by email. Um, so once again, I would like to thank uh, Professor Krishna for doing this uh, interesting um, lecture, which was extremely helpful. And I hope that uh, all of you who participated gained uh, something out of this. And uh, I'm sure this will uh, help you to improve your practice. So thank you, Professor Krishna, and thank you, um, uh, Professor Guanidi Anage, uh, for initiating this uh, webinar series, and also um, uh, Dr. Nadisha Badhani Singha for uh, helping to organize this event, and the participants who uh, came on uh, line and took their time to sit through this. And uh, uh, I hope you will join us again uh, next week. So thank you, and uh, goodbye for now. Just to say thank you for listening. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Professor Krishna. Thank you.